Um, Russ is a professor of, chem of chemistry and biology at Pasadena City College, PCC, and an SCPS member, that's this group. Um, he's been a professor of evolution and I'm sorry, and certification programs. He's currently working on a statewide climate steward program along with folks at University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, this presentation is going to be a little different than what we're used to for those of you returning, uh, for your new folks. This is how we always do it. Um, so in 2003, Bruce Carter and uh, Rusty Fiore and some friends discovered skull of a Colombian mammoth weathering out of a beach cliff along the remote stretch of coastline about 100 miles south of Ensenada. And this program is going to start out with um, they'll do some introductions and a short documentary video talking about the story, excavation, adventure um, that transformed people, all volunteers who came along. And the video is featured at the first um, International Earth Science Film Festival at the International Geological Congress in Florence, Italy in August of 2004. So it's pretty prestigious. Um, so here's where it gets a little interesting and interactive and different is after that video, they, they'll have additional discussion, but then as a panel, you, if you've been interested or wondered what it might be like to be on a scientific expedition, you get to ask questions and get feedback and things like that. Sound okay with you guys? I just sprung it on them. They had no idea that was happening. <laughs> so um, without further ado, I guess I'll hand it over and you can uh, get started. Well, that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> thank you guys all for coming. Um, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bruce Carter to do the introduction. And, uh, and then after the documentary, which is rather short, it's about 15 minutes, uh, we'll do some concluding remarks and then open up the panel for, uh, for discussion. So hopefully you guys brought some questions uh, for us, hopefully some that we can answer. And if we can't, we'll just make up. <laughs> Well, welcome. I hope we have something that you will enjoy watching because it's kind of interesting and an experience that many people don't have. Uh, my colleague Russ teaches biology classes. I used to teach, before I retired, geology classes and oceanography. Together, we designed a program to take students in summer to Baja, California to study in the field after some classroom instruction, of course, first. But then we would go for two to three weeks in Baja, California. Now, when you travel to remote areas like much of Baja, looking at the rocks and studying the geology and the biology, you of course expect to find fossils. And indeed, as expected, we found many uh, Jurassic Age marine fossils on the south side of Ensenada Bay. Or we saw, as expected, dinosaur fossils in the Badlands near El Rosario. Um, and, and, and these were dinosaur fossils, but most of them were heavily weathered and crumbly and so on. But it was enough we could always let students um, see the fragments of, of dinosaur bones. But one thing we had not expected was to find fossils in the San Quentin area, about 100 miles south of Ensenada, in a small volcanic field of shield volcanoes topped each one with a cinder cone ex from explosive eruptions and so on. Well, while exploring the tide pools, the beaches, the volcanic rocks, we came across fossils. We had previously found a camel bone and we had found land tortoises. Um, but what totally unexpected was a Colombian mammoth fossils, a skull, that was facing inside the beach cliff that was actively eroding. 
very rapidly eroding. So we contacted local paleontologists in Mexico, got letters from the um, uh, Natural History um, Museum in Mexico City and mounted an expedition to collect that fossil skull out of the cliff. Well, we did, and you'll see more about that in a minute. Um, so after this film, I can fill you in on the geology, what exactly happened, what the age is, and so on. And my understanding is this is the southernmost coastal um, um, occurrence of mammoths that had yet been discovered. So why don't we watch the film and then we can discuss a lot more about it. But we did learn not just about geology but about the local uh, conditions with the police and um, uh, problems that come up, that came up in the end. Okay, so I think we should show it now. Okay. Um, I, I might introduce uh, Sarah De Fiore, who was so inspired by this event that she majored in geology and she's now a geology professor. <laughs> Richard Johnston, who drove on many trips with us and was a major player in this episode as well. So why don't we watch the film before we do any more. around the cranium and beginning to unbury the skull. 
Baja tends to kind of make its own its own rules as you go, and fortunately we were up to the rules. The rules on those days were just as rudimentary as they were when the Egyptians were building pyramids and when the Romans were building roads. We had to pile up dirt and rocks to make a level road wide enough for the mammoth to get pulled along, line it with rocks, get it wet. This is the hardest of the work I've ever done. Getting the skull out and digging around it, we ran in shifts. I don't think digging stopped at all around the skull. It'd be like going into that wall, just digging straight in like a tunnel, carefully. And then as you approach the edge of the skull, which is about that big around, you'd have to dust with a brush and get real close and then don't touch that and then dig some more. And, and just the, the constant digging. Um, I don't think my hand stopped digging for like eight or nine hours in one day. But we'd shift. Different people would work different aspects of it, so nobody got tired. And it was amazing. Bowers was not the first mammoth in, uh, in, in uh, San Quentin, but it was the one that had the perfect skull and the tusks and was so well preserved. After visiting the site, paleontologists from the Natural History Museum judged that the tusks would probably be in pretty bad condition, and they recommended that we simply cut them off to make it possible to recover the remainder of the skull intact. Well, it wasn't quite so simple as that. I don't think this dog's doing it. I go in through the fence. Uh, now, now I'm dulling the teeth on the ivory. What, how you cut a foot of ivory, this is something that most people, that, and we have a lot of craftsmen on the job, who've cut lumber and steel and all these different things, to cut ivory that's, uh, you know, tens of thousands of years old, you know, um, <laughs> without chipping it or damaging it. They were in great shape. We could not chip them apart, but my chainsaw was there handy, and so we took the chainsaw. The chainsaw blade was about this big, and it was my dad's poor chainsaw, and oh, he was pissed. But the greatest <laughs> tool of what we brought, which we thought would play a little bitty role, was the chainsaw and uh, thinking to, to be able to cut timbers to size to fit for shoring, but uh, um, having that for uh, for what we used it for was was really swell. It was scary standing back in the hole with you know Jimi Hendrix is in this hole like twists around chainsawing up to cut the bottom of the hole and there's just smoke pouring out of the hole. We had a line of people with with or like the big Tupperware lid fanning the oil smoke because he couldn't breathe in there. So all kinds of white oil smoke coming out. Uh, did anybody explain Jimi Hendrix? Wow, I feel like I should say a prayer or something. Yeah. <laughs> My expertises were ten fingers, keeping uh, keeping everyone with their fingers, and uh, uh, hopefully getting the thing out in as uh, big a one piece as we possibly could. The next morning, as soon as it got light, we started in again. We continued the excavation underneath the mammoth to free up the bottom, and we finished the plaster jacket, which was a slow job underneath the mammoth. We had to hold the plaster up underneath and let it dry. It wasn't until mid-afternoon that we were ready to actually take the plaster jacketed skull and try to bring it out. This rigging was really amazing, that chain going up and then a rope and my truck up on the cliff and then come alongs, two of them attached to a boulder behind. <laughs> Jimmy was on a radio, Jimmy Hendrix was telling, talking to me and running the come along and we basically told everybody else to get back because if a cable snaps or something with that much tension, you could kill somebody. It could have so swung wrong and crushed somebody. Uh, I mean, I don't know nobody was hurt. Nobody got hurt. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Nobody got hurt. <laughs> then we tried to drag the skull a hundred feet along the base of the cliff. Well, we tried come alongs to do this. We tried prying with four by fours, and we were starting to look as if we weren't going to make any progress at all. Finally, we realized we had one option still. We had a tugboat rope, a very large one, 
about uh, four or five inches in diameter and about 20 feet long. We tied that to the skull, which was resting on top of the car hood sled. When we did it on the count of three, everybody would take a large heave and it would move, maybe an inch. And it was uh, absolutely unique, a once in a lifetime kind of gig that uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't script it the way the thing went down. We began to get six inches maybe a foot or even a couple of feet each time we did it. It was a remarkable event. It's just a dynamic that happens so rarely in your life. Maybe one or maybe ten times in your whole life. You get that kind of cooperation and feeling among people. We managed to pull it a hundred feet down the cliff in a matter of less than half an hour. We backed the truck up to the edge of the cliff and were getting ready to start dragging that thing up the cliff. And we saw coming along the dirt road towards us from the village were police cars. The local police um, came first. And, and followed by the state police, followed by the federal. I was here. I kept coming up to my dad saying, Dad, are we going to go to jail? Are we going to go to jail? <laughs> they were good bureaucrats. They went strictly by the book. We had proof that we were, had, you know, did, did this with good intentions and had applied for the permit, but we didn't have the permit signed in our hand. And they told us, and they assured us they would protect the site and so on, and indeed, as they should have. Um, we were there with them for at least three hours until it got completely dark and finally we went home. Tell me what you did yesterday. Yesterday, I shoveled all kinds of sand and I loaded picks and sledgehammers and made my, I got really sunburned and made myself really sore and it's awesome. Now I heard that I'm tired, but it's great. <laughs> We spent a long afternoon frustrated without getting any official uh, protection for the mammoth. We had some people went back Sunday morning and they saw that in fact there were no police guarding the site and there were vandals. By now there were 20 or 30 people gathered around. There were people rocking and in fact they turned the mammoth over the skull on its side where it was actually down to where it would be exposed to the beach wash at high tide. I think, I think, I think overall though, even though it's bad it was an actual skull and everything, but the whole overall experience and like pulling it out and that we did do it with the people and the stuff we had, it was, you know, it was really I know paleontologists who will never get a chance to do that. Um, there are uh, professional paleontologists that spend their whole careers in dusty, uh, you know, godforsaken places, and here we had this chance to come in in a short amount of time and do this salvage that brought this thing out in absolutely pristine condition, far better than, uh, than, we, than we could have imagined. One of the things that most people may never get a chance to fully experience is the camaraderie that develops when you have a group of people who undertake what seems an insurmountable task and manage to succeed. And so that was probably the best part of the entire process was the interaction with the folks who were there.
just a couple of comments. We'll let Dr. Carter finish off the, uh, with, with a more detailed description of things. But I wanted to point out just a few things, and that is the, the skull, as was mentioned, is in a museum in Ensenada. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Traffic. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. Oh, thanks. This is Jimi Hendrix, by the way. <laughs> All right. Thank um, you for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, the, uh, the skull itself is at the museum in Ensenada, at the Anthropology Museum. And um, Gregorio Pacheco, who was mentioned here at the end, um, also was a student on this trip. He was a, um, just a, like a, maybe a sophomore student, and he participated in this as a student. Um, was inspired, I guess, and now he's a professional paleontologist. And uh, he's led two expeditions back to the same location where they excavated the, um, the tusks and several other parts of the mammoth from that site. Mm -hmm. So one of the students who was really, uh, you know, just kind of inspired at that moment has gone on and now continued. He actually works here in Los Angeles working on construction sites and various other things as an anthrop or anthropologist and paleontologist. Um, anyway, so there's, there's sort of an ongoing history. Many of the young people that you saw um, in this have gone on to have careers in science. Several of them have PhDs in geology, um, biology. Several of them are working as professionals in the field as well. And one of those students actually worked here at the museum for a while um, as a, a media person. So uh, interesting, you just never know when you get a bunch of people together what might happen. So Bruce, would you like to tell us a little more about the, the geology, perhaps, of that? Okay, well, um, let, let me just give you the geological context. Um, this skull was facing into the cliff and being eroded away from the rear end of the fossil. So all the rest of the bones of the body beyond, besides the skull had been eroded away. And in fact, we found a few little fragments in the beach cement um, uh, of, the, um, um, of the tide pool area. But in fact, we didn't find any more of that particular fossil. Um, the, okay, so the age of the mammoth was probably about 18,000 years old based on the um, age of exposure of the lava flows nearby. It was buried by a, um, uh, an explosion which happened in all of these volcanoes at one time or another where water, groundwater, seeped into the magma chamber or the vice versa and it exploded up and so this was a mass of volcanic ash and cinders that buried the mammoth and killed the mammoth and whatever else was in that area at the time. The cinder cone that exploded was less than a mile from where this fossil was found. Um, and it was lying upside down and the cinder layer was only about half a meter thick and so it had buried the, the skull partially but the jaws stuck up above the ground surface and the jaws weathered moderately heavily and before they fell over and then were buried by later sand and so on. Remember now, at 18,000 years ago, sea level would have been about 300 feet lower than it is now. So this was a broad plain that the mammoths were uh, occupied and then some of them got killed by this. Um, another mammoth was found in town subsequent to our uh, excursion. And then the week 
The next time we went down to that same location, we found another mammoth skull. This was a much smaller one, and it was a juvenile mammoth, um, and it was very badly deteriorated. We tried repeatedly to get carbon-14 dates on it, but remember, this was in the intertidal zone. It would get soaking wet repeatedly every high tide. And so they have been uh, unable to get the actual age, but the most recent eruption uh, by surface exposure dates was about 18 or 19,000 years ago. Um, and then we learned about digging mammoths or any other fossils in Baja, California. Things are so disorganized and nobody communicates with anybody else. Um, multiple police forces and, even, and the military and uh, the federales were, we tried to get them to help us preserve that fossil, but that was not possible to do. We even had a paleontologist, a Mexican guy, at the University of Baja, California, who told us that, yeah, that's just a, a fact of life. He said he'd spent a few nights in jail himself while he was excavating this So that's a little background about this fossil, even though, um, um, well, and there was one intact jaw that's at the University of Baja, California, that, you know, so a professional paleontologist can study those. Okay, so that's just a, a brief summary of what the geological context is. So, I think we're ready to um, field questions. Yes. Um, were, were you concerned that the hill had a fall on you? Because I noticed that you didn't take down the overburden first. No, it was. <laughs> 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 you got the cord? I'll come over here. No, 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 you're good. We got it. You got it. Jimmy, would you repeat the question? Uh, the question was about the uh, the cornice that was that was hanging over from the bluff face which was the sandstone bluff. And what we did is we parked up on top and we kind of chose our place and went about the, uh, the, the daily occupation of putting the kids through their paces in the intertidal pools. And <clears throat> let me answer your question first. No ma'am, we had no concern whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, what what kind of started the whole thing? Let me let me back up just a little bit, and I'm so sorry to be late. But the uh, um, the deal was when we arrived at this spot, I asked Dr. Carter, uh, Mr. De Fiore was in charge of the Estudiante that day, and said, "Come on, kids, we're going down intertidal transect one more time." And so I said to Carter, "Hey, what do you do here?" He said, "Oh, I always walk this bluff." and I looked for camel fossils. They've been known to be found here. And so I said, okay, I'll do that. So they all went down to the ocean, and I walked along this way, saw nothing. Went around this way, saw nothing. Came back, the truck's up on the top, and I looked down at the rocks, and I'm like, well, that looks unusual. It was a femur. It was the mammoth femur that was as big as my fist and about 18 inches long. And I reached down and pulled that thing up. And when Mr. De Fiore and Dr. Carter came back at the end of the, the thing, uh, they said, so how'd you do Jimmy? And I just pointed my thumb to the hood of the truck. And I said, well, I found that. And everybody went, what? <laughs> so it was, a, it was a beautiful fossil. And Mr. De Fiore came back weeks later and we located where it was on the bluff, and he came back weeks later and said, if the femur's there, I'll bet there's something else back up over there. And what we called it was an emergency rescue, because one more 
big old winter storm would have washed out that remaining thing. I mean, we found it, it was up to its neck. And what Dr. Carter didn't uh, talk about right now is that he said that they were upside down, the head was upside down. That's true, the skull. Um, what we didn't know is that the tusks went back into the hillside. Okay. To get the tusks, we actually talked to the Natural History Museum beforehand, and they said, oh, if you find tusks, they're going to be all punky, and there's going to be nothing there, and here's a little bit of epoxy, kids. Pat, pat, pat. <laughs> <laughs> and off we went back to Mexico. But uh, uh, what we, in fact, found was tusks as hard as ivory. Wow. And to get, in our time frame, to get that skull out of the hillside, and up the road and up the thing, as you saw in the film, uh, we needed to sever those tusks. And so, <clears throat> one of the top cool five, one of the top five coolest things that I've ever done in my life is taking a chainsaw <laughs> to 13,000-year-old mammoth tusk, and, and it was hash browns coming out the bottom. Oh. It, was, it was unbelievable. And we were able to jacket the whole thing and pull the whole thing out and start it on down our road that we'd spent the day and a half making. Uh, so, um, <laughs> where am I going with all this? <laughs> Well, we thought the rock above the excavation was, was solid firm enough. enough that yes. we could do it. Yes. And so, unlike Encinitas, three weeks ago, or four weeks ago, where people were setting down below um, the, the bluff, it's, it's that same kind of sandstone bluff that just, without warning, it's like a eucalyptus tree, the thing collapses and uh, those poor people. But uh, we hit it so hard. The other thing that I want to say is Dr. Carter alluded to the fact that in this lady's backyard, she went to dig up banyos, and she said, all I want is a potty in the backyard. <laughs> and they found this mammoth <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> and she's like, ay, caramba. And so all of a sudden, all these people swooped in, and it was, okay, we're going to do this excavation. Two and a half years later, she still has no banos. Her in complete backyard was was this thing that came down to the thing and you know picking away with little bitty brushes and the whole thing. So it was it was what we think in hindsight, and I'm speaking for myself, is that we kind of blew in and found this thing and brought people back and the stuff back, and it really kind of pissed off some of the local people because they were like, hey, we're, we've got this dig going on, and what are you doing here? <coughs> what, what you should also understand is that mammut, the uh, fossil tusk, is an aphrodisiac. How do you argue with that? And so... The, wh what we left in the hillside, remember the chainsaw? What we left in the hillside was immediately confiscated by the locals, and who could blame them? It's their beach, it's their mammoth, whatever. And uh, so it was, it was truly an amazing, amazing experience. And when I saw the date that it was 2003 that we were back there doing the whole thing, I'm like, oh, man, where did, where did the time go? <laughs> so... Anyway, without taking more, yes, ma'am. So where was the fossil earmarked to go? Like, when you asked for the permission, where would it have gone? The University of Ensenada. Okay. University of Mexico, Ensenada. And that was our initial entree to the whole thing. And the paperwork that we provided, it seems, was not sufficient to that day, that evening, <laughs> that time. So uh, the... You know the locals kind of confiscated the thing, and and uh, but it was uh, it was an amazing adventure. And um, <coughs> the, the, the last and final thing, and I'll sit down. <laughs> that I want to say is that many pale, uh, um, paleontologists spend their entire career out in godforsaken places with driven sand and the whole thing in their eyes, and they never ever come across this sort of actual pull-it-out-of-the-ground extrication, and that 
circles back to what I said at the beginning, that this was one of the top five coolest things I've ever done in my life, was doing that thing. <laughs> so I, I'm very grateful that you all came out tonight to hear our story, and uh, that's all I got. And this is Mr. Uh, Richard Johnson, and he, he made the film. <laughs> I have my uh, brother-in-law build a thing. He just does this professionally, and he gave me some pointers along the way. He doesn't remember now because it was a long time ago. But uh, it was very amateur work, but they had some great editing. The secret was taking a hell of a lot of footage and then turning it over to someone who knew what they could do. And there's a lot that we've left out. Uh, we have the secret cuts, you know, the, the singing at night, and Bruce doing an incredible, you all come, Gospel thing. We couldn't do it if we up by yourself. We could do it all together. It was. Mm -hmm. Let's see. That was probably uh, where the camaraderie all came together for oh, me. Oh, it came together. Yeah. That night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. More questions. Wendy. I want Sarah to tell us how she went from French literature to theology. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, yes, I, I'm sorry. I was corrupted. I started out like humanities, and then I ran into these people. <laughs> and uh, by the time we did the Mammoth I was already in graduate school at UCLA, and a couple of my classmates from that time came and helped and kept pulling me aside and saying, you've never met people like this. We've never met people like this. <laughs> you won't again. And it, it was a really special, special event. Um, but, you know, a lot of people in this room know that. I, I see faces from some field trips in Sea <coughs> Valley and uh, other parts of Los Angeles. And it's, uh, it's Mother Nature. You take people outside, you take young people outside, and that's it. There goes their, uh, their previous academic goals, and they, <laughs> 20 years later, they find themselves having fun. <laughs> so, thank you for the question. Yeah, I'm on the back. I was wondering if the various fossils that you find, um, if it was possible to sequence their genomes. You know, the condition of these particular fossils was not terrific. Because of their proximity to the coast and the penetration of salt water back into the cliff, and, you know, with various tidal cycles and just the general, like, crystallization, the salts accumulating in the fossils, they're not in very good shape. We couldn't even get a carbon-14 date from any of the fossils we found at that site, not just this particular, but others that we found because of that. There's, there's really no, uh, no biological material left you know, that could be used for DNA sequencing or even for dating. Yeah. Do they know where the cops are? Oh, yes. They, they are in the museum, um, the Anthropology Museum in Ensenada. So I don't know if you're familiar with that. <laughs> Most people haven't seen it. They have a lovely museum, and they have a lot of uh, Pleistocene fossils there. And are the cells in good condition? Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, um, they're not in the open display area, but they, uh, they went back. I think I mentioned one of the students who was on that trip. Uh, led expeditions back there to extract them, and the, and the skull as well, and they're all in the same place. One of the things uh, that Jimmy alluded to that we weren't familiar with was that the, uh, the, there's two major scientific divisions in Mexico that deal with artifacts like this. One's the Anthropology Institute and the other is the university system. And the Anthropology Institute has more power politically. And we were not partnered with them. Uh, that therein lies part of our problem. Uh, we didn't know that going in. We thought the university would be the place to go for permits and partnerships, but it turns out no. <laughs> in the far back, gentlemen. Did you that you eventually uh, fishing boat rescued the skull? Fishermen. fishermen. Yeah, yeah, local fishermen. In fact, uh, there was a shot in there of a bunch of local individuals standing around. One of those gentlemen who was a local fisherman, uh, him and his, his friends got their truck around and pulled it up the cliff just like we had planned to. And they kept it on site in their garage for quite a long time until the Anthropology Institute finally came back to get it. Was it damaged? It was. They, uh, someone had extracted one of the molars um, by chipping it out. 
Um, I think it's a loaf of bread. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and then the, that, I think that was it. So it had one molar intact, one molar had been removed, and there was a little bit of other damage, but you know, that's, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Did you have a picture of the skull as yeah. it is today? Uh, not with me, no. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose we should we should have ended with that. <laughs>